It's the first action in World War II for George S. Patton and his men. More than 100,000 Allied troops storm the North African coast. Green American fighting men are bloodied for the first time. Patton said he would leave the beach a hero or a corpse. But will a medieval fortress bristling with modern weaponry shatter his invasion before it begins? General George S. Patton, his bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II on this 360-degree battlefield. Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, blood and guts. The first showdown for the Americans against Hitler's German army didn't come in Europe, but in Tunisia, North Africa. Here, in February of 1943, the American army is holding Kasserine Pass, the gateway to American supply bases to the west in Algeria. The German tanks leading the attack are under the expert command of the Desert Fox, dreaded German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. The thing you see about Rommel is an ability to adapt, coupled with a relentless aggressiveness. He's got great instincts. He's got the ability to get inside the minds of his adversary, understand their psychology, and to dominate their psychology. The pass is one mile wide and 2,000 American troops guarded. Many are in foxholes across the floor, and some are in the foothills that flank the pass. A mile behind the troops are 36 tank destroyers, along with a few tanks. Out in front of the Americans, the enemy is bearing down on them with 100 tanks and 8,000 men. William Harper is a 21-year-old artilleryman from Dallas, Texas. The Germans were good soldiers. They'd been in combat, a lot of them. We just didn't have any experience. First time going into combat, you really never know what to expect. Some men are shaking, some are throwing up, some are crying, some are energized. But deep down inside, everybody's a little bit scared. As the enemy armor closes in, the U.S. troops are rattled by German artillery. Especially the ear-splitting, screaming Mimi rocket launcher. You got a psychological effect that said, oh my god, you know, this is a main attack. They're really launching the artillery on us. We are really in for it. The American defense begins to crumble as the German tanks of the 10th Panzer Division punch through. Lawrence Marcus is a 25-year-old lieutenant, also from Dallas. I saw tanks appearing, German tanks appearing over the ridge and shells popping around us. You could see that this 10th Panzer Division was aggressive, knew what they were trying to do, and we knew that we were undermanned. U.S. troops are soon in full retreat, and the American crusade to stop Hitler is in grave jeopardy. Everybody says we're on our own. It was chaotic. 200 American lives are lost, and hundreds more are wounded. It's a catastrophic turn of events, especially for an eager force of soldiers that entered the war with such confidence under General George S. Patton's command in the first weeks of November. Unfortunately, Patton isn't here in Kasserine. 
he stuck in Morocco after leading the American landing forces during the initial invasion of North Africa months earlier. That must have driven Patton crazy. And he's a warrior. All warriors want to go to the sound of the guns. He really wanted to be in that fight, because glory, battle, that's what Patton's about. Flashback, November 1942. Patton heads across the Atlantic with the U.S. invasion force aboard the cruiser USS Augusta. His men have nicknamed him Blood and Guts. It comes from a notoriously off-color speech he often gives to prepare his men for battle. He tells them they'll need to keep their wits about them, even when shells are landing and they're covered with the blood and guts of what used to be their friends. He's the guts in our blood. <laughs> He was always on the offensive. He believed philosophically you keep the enemy on his heels and you can do whatever you want to him. He's a hothead, and he speaks his mind when he should keep his mouth shut. But his leaders know he'll get the job done. His emphasis on bold action, on leadership from the front, his disdain for passivity, Patton really understood the profession of warfare. Patton has a lust for glory. Most men in his circumstances wouldn't be anywhere near a war zone. He's from a wealthy landowning family near Pasadena, California, and he's married the daughter of a Boston industrialist. He's an aristocrat who could be living a life of leisure, but he believes his rightful place is on the battlefield. Patton's ancestors were war heroes, and he grew up worshiping his ancestors and warriors in general. He wants nothing more than to go down in history as a great military leader. He felt that it was his destiny to lead a large army in a great, desperate struggle. And so Patton prepared his whole life for that responsibility. Glory hound or not, he's never shrunk from danger. As a young officer, he gains notice in 1916 by hunting down and killing Mexican rebels in a Wild West-style shootout. Later, he leads one of the first US tank units in World War I, taking a bullet through the hip in the process. The soldiers wanted to remove him from the battlefield, and he said no. He kept directing his, his fight. He kept directing the tanks. And for this heroic action, he not only gained great press reputation, which Patton enjoyed, but he also was put in for the Distinguished Service Cross. Now, Patton is ready for his first big moment in World War II. As the invasion fleet crosses the Atlantic, Hitler controls most of Europe and North Africa. Only Britain stands alone in the West. The Americans believed that the quickest way to defeat the enemy was to stage in Britain, cross the English Channel, and march straight for Berlin. The British, particularly Prime Minister Churchill, said, wait a minute, they're tougher than you think they are. You're greener than you think you are. It would be best if we first look for a place on the periphery. Churchill wants to invade Northwest Africa because it's an opening to Southern Europe, and it's relatively weakly guarded. German and Italian troops aren't defending Northwest Africa. The Vichy French are. Of course, the French have been an American ally in the past. But when Hitler invades France in 1940, he makes a deal with part of the French leadership. Hitler allows the new Vichy government to keep control of the southern half of France and their North African protectorates if they swear allegiance to him. They do so half-heartedly, but this now puts them at odds with Patton's landing forces. At age 57, with more than 30 years of military service under his belt, Patton is finally coming face to face with his destiny. He is preparing to lead 34,000 soldiers in a bloody invasion of the North African coast. And the words of his wealthy father-in-law must be echoing in his mind. I'll win the money for the family, Georgie. You win the glory. As the Armada nears its target, he notes in his diary, every once in a while, the tremendous responsibility of this job lands on me like a ton of bricks. 
but mostly, I am not in the least worried. I can't decide logically if I'm a man of destiny or a lucky fool, but I think I am destined. As large as Patton's force is, it's just one-third of the 100,000 man American and British invasion of North Africa under the code name Operation Torch. Everybody's kind of nervous, fear of the unknown. But you know, every soldier trains for this day, and it's, it's go time. It's time to show what the Americans can do. It's time to take the fight to Hitler. One invasion force will hit the beach near Algiers, one near Iran, and one near Casablanca in Morocco. George Patton commands the task force landing in Morocco. He's nervous that bad weather could make a safe landing impossible and he decides against a direct assault on Casablanca, since his 34,000 soldiers will be vulnerable while landing and may be outnumbered by as many as 50,000 enemy troops in the city. Patton decides to split his task force into three groups, so the largest force in the middle has protection on both flanks. Patton will lead the center group himself, where the bulk of the infantry will be for the invasion. He decides to land at Fadala, a safe distance of six miles north of Casablanca. His southern group will try to land medium tanks at Safi, 140 miles south of Casablanca. And the general's northern group will land at Port Lyote, 60 miles north of Casablanca, and attempt to capture a vital airfield. Then, the final prize. Target, Morocco's largest city, Casablanca. Tactics, pound the invasion beaches with naval gunfire, overwhelm the defenders with landing forces. Strategy, move the landing forces inland, then converge on Casablanca. By the pre-dawn hours of November 8th, 1942, George Patton's landing forces are just off the Moroccan coast and poised to storm the beaches of three different cities. As infantrymen climb down cargo nets into landing craft, it's unknown if the Vichy French forces will choose to fight or not. 23-year-old infantry platoon leader Bill Voller entered the war from Cicero, Illinois. He's trying to deal with the jitters of his first combat but he's also been given strange instructions. And even they told us to be, not to fire first if we can help them when we go ashore because maybe they'll welcome us because they've been our allies before. Patton's troops motor through the surf in their Higgins boats. 700 yards ahead, spotlights strike and machine guns on shore open up and begin raking the landing craft with bullets. And from Casablanca Harbor, six miles south, shells from French warships begin whizzing overhead. Patton's troops are in for a fight. November 8th, 1942, 5 a.m. Fadala, Morocco. The ships of George S. Patton's Operation Torch landing force idle in the swell just off the Moroccan coast. Patton commands 34,000 men in three task forces. They'll land near Casablanca and try to surround and capture Morocco's largest city. This is Patton the warrior, his philosophy that he was born to lead armies. There's glory in war. There's a destiny for soldiers. And Patton lives this role. Patton's infantrymen charge into a firestorm as their Higgins boats approach the shore. Patton's men are more vulnerable than today's landing forces. Troops today are better protected and don't have to wade ashore. If the Marine Corps will conduct a, an amphibious landing operation today, they do so with AAVs, which are uh, the actual armored vehicles, armored personnel carriers that can swim in the water and can deliver a part of a squad to an open beach so that they can begin fighting um, and secure a beachhead to allow then the larger landing craft to come in afterward. 
15,000 troops in Patton's middle landing force storm ashore in their simple wooden boats. They're up against well-entrenched Vichy machine gun emplacements as they try to seize the nearby town of Fadala for use as Patton's headquarters. Before Patton's boats make it to land, from Casablanca Harbor, six miles south, French naval gun rounds begin screaming overhead. Like many others in the Higgins boats, 20-year-old Walter Ehlers of Fort Riley, Kansas, is miserably seasick. We were wobbling around out there in the water, and it really made me sick. And so I had my head over the side, and, and the French were shelling us from Casablanca, and these shells were just barely going over our heads. And I thought, God, it's just one of those that hit my head who I, would put me out of my misery. Walt Ehlers will become one of the rare soldiers to land in North Africa and fight in battle after battle over the coming years in Sicily and across Europe. The first thing I want to do is kiss the soil though after I got off that boat because my seasickness went away right away. It was unbelievable how fast that can go away when you land <laughs> you know, on terra firma. But for other men, this first action will also be their last. Uh, the first person I saw killed on the beach, his leg was, had been hit, and it was right angle from his body right in the middle of his thigh. And it was really gruesome looking. Of course, he's laying on his face. As dawn breaks, French naval gunfire from Casablanca Harbor zeroes in on USS Augusta, Patton's ship. Ensign Frank Daly is aboard a nearby destroyer, USS Edison. I could observe large shell splashes at sea so that I knew that a major vessel must be firing. The major vessel is the Jean Bart, the fairly new battleship has only one of its main gun turrets installed, so it stays in the harbor, but still packs a wallop. Six miles north, the American battleship USS Massachusetts is one of the escort vessels that has come along in support of Patton's landing forces. It more than matches the Jean Bart in firepower. The Massachusetts fired on the John Bart, and the John Bart fired on the Massachusetts. And there were what you might call short uh, duels between the two ships. When the Jean Bart and other French warships target USS Augusta, the cruiser carrying Patton, the general is leaning on the rail of the main deck. They fire a yellow dime marker that lands near the Augusta. The water erupts. Patton ends up covered in yellow dye from this marker that the French will now use to concentrate their fire. So here's General Patton, dripping wet, yellow dye all over him. An aide rushes up to clean Patton's jacket, but old blood and guts quickly brushes him aside. Well, that's Patton for you, you know? He wants to be out there mixing it up with the enemy. Getting a bit dirty, that's just part of the job. It's almost like a badge of honor for him. None of the shells from the Jean Bart damaged the cruiser carrying Patton. And over the next couple of hours, USS Massachusetts batters the Jean Bart mercilessly. Not until 1 p.m. does General Patton finally make it to the beach. It's a mess. Stuck landing craft are everywhere. Jumbled supplies and equipment are all over the place. Bloated bodies of American GIs are washing up, and very few people seem to be doing anything to try to straighten it out. So Patton takes matters into his own hands. He starts barking directions and making things happen. In a time like that, when you have a stall, you need somebody just like Patton, old blood and guts to just put a boot in your butt and get you moving. And he's the kind of guy that'll do it, lead by example. 
But while the general is bringing order to the beaches here at Fadala, Patton's other landing groups are under murderous fire from French infantry and aircraft. 140 miles south of Casablanca, Patton's southern landing group is storming the beaches and harbor at the small port of Safi, Morocco. This force is under the command of Major General Ernie N. Harmon, an old cavalry man. Harmon's job is to seize Safi's port intact and get Patton's medium tanks ashore. Safi has a working dock with a crane. It's the only way to get heavy tanks on shore quickly. And the object was to put them ashore at Safi and then run them up to Casablanca as fast as they could. If the tanks don't make it north soon, Patton won't have the firepower he needs to grab his key objective. Harmon's men have to seize the port quickly before the tank unloading cranes can be sabotaged. To take the port's 450 Vichy French defenders by surprise, two U.S. destroyers charge directly into the harbor and disgorge 400 infantrymen on the docks. To gain advantage required shock action, unexpected action, and then to follow up on the initial surprise with, with bold offensive action. The French infantrymen open fire. But Harmon's men quickly overwhelm the defenders. The enemy fighters fall back, but continue sniping from covered positions. Meanwhile, three miles north of Safi's port, more of Harmon's landing forces are hitting the beaches. 24-year-old Chicagoan Frank McDermott wades to shore in chest-high water. They let us off in the water. In fact, I was carrying a submachine gun, Thompson submachine gun, and a fabric case. We went ashore holding the gun and the case up above our head so it wouldn't get wet, and we were wet all the way to the shoulders. The soldiers landing on the beaches away from the port don't face much resistance on the ground. But French aircraft strafe them mercilessly. They strafed us while we were on the ship, while we were getting off the ship, and while we were on shore. Scared the hell out of you. You didn't know what's going on. You didn't see anything, and then all of a sudden you hear the plane, and you hear the strafing. You couldn't hide. All you did was dig in and try to stay safe. If the Safi landing is going to succeed, somebody's got to take out those enemy aircraft. November 8th, 1942. Moroccan coast. Major General George S. Patton is on a beach a few miles from Casablanca leading his main task force in the invasion of Morocco. The rest of his 34,000 troops are landing north and south of him in order to converge on their target. Patton believed that, that leaders had to lead from the front. Men had to feel the presence of the commander. The commander had to set the example. 140 miles south of Patton, on beaches near the port of Safi, French aircraft are blistering Patton's southern forces with lead. The soldiers have no weapons other than the small arms they could bring with them in the landing craft. How good is a rifle against a dive bomb? If you don't have the right heavy equipment, heavy guns, buddies, and your troops dying right in front of you, it's completely frustrating. The only chance of knocking that murderous fire out of the sky is naval anti-aircraft guns. But so far, the Navy's not up to the job. To my recollection, I don't think the Navy hit an aircraft. It will be a totally different world today. The world of today, dominated by the surface-to-air missile. And the state of that art is extremely advanced. It's so advanced that in the 1990s, 
the Bosnians and the Serbs are capable of um, defending airspace from even the most modern combat aircraft. But in 1942, heat-seeking and radar-guided surface-to-air missiles are years away. That's bad news for Frank McDermott. He's stuck in the middle of that strafing all day, going up and down the beach. He's a supply technician with the 67th Armored Regiment. His job is to move supplies from landing craft to trucks headed inland. Some of the vehicles were hit, and of course, if some of the vehicles, they were close to some of the personnel. Landing all of the troops, tanks, and supplies at Safi will take a couple of days. And as night falls at the end of the first day, Frank McDermott and his buddies, still only partially dry, have no place to sleep except on the sand. Fortunately, the French aircraft don't strafe at night, so the men have one less worry. But the cold is a serious problem. We had no clothes or duffel bag to rely on. That was on one of the trucks somewhere. We didn't know where. We couldn't find anything to cover with or to, to lay down and sleep. But these wet, suffering men demonstrate some Yankee ingenuity in their battle against the cold. There was a lot of cornflakes, cartons, car large cartons of cornflakes. The cornflakes were in regular cornflakes boxes. So we took the boxes and laid them out as a mattress, and we covered with the cartons. And that was our cover for the night. It was, it was cold. It was damn cold, and it was a rough night. As dawn breaks on November 9th, day two of Operation Torch, French Renault light tanks are on the attack. Patton's three landing forces are vulnerable, still bringing equipment and heavier weapons ashore for the big battle looming in Casablanca. The French tanks are headed toward Port Leone, 100 miles north of Casablanca, to blow American landing troops to pieces. Two miles north, ready to blast anyone they see, are seven American M5 Stewart tanks. The American tanks are facing south, protecting the landings at Port Leone by flanking the main road along the coast. Two on the west side, five on the east. The Stuarts are also light tanks. The American M5 Stuart easily outmatches the Renault R35 in all aspects except armament. The similar 37 millimeter main guns are a draw. But at 16 and a half tons, the Stuart outweighs the R-35. And it's much faster, with a speed of 36 miles per hour. Its maximum armor is also thicker at two inches. Tank machine gunner and 19-year-old Columbus, Ohio native Irving Bromberg trained in Stuarts before heading to North Africa. Four men have to squeeze into the cramped Stuart. Well, one was a bow gunner, one was the driver, and up in the turret, that was the radio and loader and the tank commander, and the tank commander did the shooting and commanded the tank. Dawn is still breaking when the Renaults pull within range. Between 14 and 18 light tanks of their own Renault tanks, and uh, at least a battalion of infantry. They walk right into this little ambush. The American tanks let her rip. The American tanks maneuver at times, looking for the kill. But they only move forward and backward, knowing that disaster can strike by exposing their sides to the enemy. The tank was always in this forward position. The most vulnerable part of a tank would be in the back of the tank or the side of the tank. So if you turn the tank around and that 37 would knock you out real fast. You wouldn't stand a chance. But being on even, you know, playing field, 37 millimeter and 37 millimeter, it was just a matter of quantity, you know, overpowering the other one. 
Manhattan's tankers are in danger of being overwhelmed. At dawn on day two of Operation Torch, George S. Patton's landing forces are still slugging it out with Vichy French on the coast of Morocco. to get the rest of his troops and equipment on shore quickly if he hopes to capture his key objective of Casablanca before a major counterattack. He always emphasized the initiative, you know, gaining an advantage by using speed of action. So the enemy was always reacting you know, to what you're imposing on the enemy, setting the terms of battle. Patton has spent the night in a captured hotel in Fadala, six miles north of Casablanca. At dawn, He's back out at the beach, making sure everyone gets ashore on the double. In the north, at Port Leone, American and French light tanks are fighting it out on the coast road. The French outnumber the Americans and are gaining the advantage. But just when the Americans look like they're going to crack, in the sky overhead, a U.S. naval aircraft happens on the scene, a godsend for Patton's tankers. The pilot calls in naval gunfire from the nearby cruiser USS Savannah. 15 six-inch guns, rapid fire. They could just make mincemeat out of tanks quickly. That was it, and that's what's a turning point. It was like music to their ears. It was like music to their ears. The French tank crews that are left alive lose heart and retreat. Landings continue throughout the day at Port Leone, and infantry fighting continues. Still, by the evening of the second day of Operation Torch, the main objective for General George S. Patton's Northern Landing Group has not been taken. There was an airfield slightly inland uh, up the Cebu River. The intent was to capture the airfield so that these 70 some airplanes could land and participate in the campaign in Morocco. The mouth of the river is dominated by an old Portuguese fort called the Casbah. Some 250 French troops man the Casbah, and their defensive fire is deadly. In addition to the Casbah, there's a second obstacle to river access, a one and a half inch steel cable barrier across the river mouth. The landing force at Port Laoti is under the command of General Lucian K. Truscott. General Lucian Truscott also, you know, he shared the same kind of background with Pat, another cavalry officer. He's an extraordinarily talented and determined uh, commander who made tremendous contributions to World War II. At 5.30 a.m. on November 10th, 1942, day three of Operation Torch, an American destroyer, USS Dallas, charges the Cebu River. On board is Truscott's raiding force of 75 men, hell-bent on capturing the airfield. USS Dallas is a World War I-era four-stack destroyer. It's been stripped to lighten its load, since the Cebu River is very shallow. Arthur Beaumont, a 19-year-old crew member from Boston, knows this is not a typical Navy mission. The crew was given uh, the same clothing that the Raiders had, and we were given weapons. I had a submachine gun. Other people had weapons, every one of us, because if the ship had been sunk, we was to go ashore with the Raiders. The Dallas must ram the cable blocking the river. It's dangerous. The cable could damage the hull or get caught in the screws. The warship slices through it anyway and she immediately draws artillery fire from the Casbah. We got one round from the Casbah, lift out our bow a little bit. And the next round lifted our stern just after us, didn't hit us. We kept on going up the river then. 
pressing its engines to full capacity to make it through the mud, the Dallas also strains to make its way between two sunken French ships. Finally, at 7.20 a.m., USS Dallas reaches its goal, the Port Laoti Airfield. We got fire from a seven, French 75 on the port side. The shells were hit uh, about 50 or 60 feet from us, and we were getting wet. And we were firing at them, but we couldn't see them. They were behind a building. Just as a naval aircraft helps save Patton's tankers at Port Laoti, yet another naval aircraft brings much needed aid to the gunners of the Dallas. This time with an unconventional use of a depth charge. One of the aircraft off of the carrier dropped the depth charges on that gun and that stopped it. 20 minutes later, the American Raiders have seized control of the airstrips and command buildings. I could look across and see them uh, paddling in, in there. We got in there and the French surrendered. Really an amazing job, particularly when you're taking fire from two or three locations uh, ashore. It's something that I'm proud of. But even with the airfield in hand, the battle for control of Port Laoti is far from over. The 250 French defenders inside the Casbah still show every indication that they'll fight Patton's troops to the death. November 10th, 1942, 8 a.m. Port Laoti. Morocco. It's day three of Operation Torch. Cannon and machine gun fire are still flying from the Casbah, the old Portuguese fort at the mouth of the Cebu River. Bullets and shrapnel are killing Patton soldiers, stopping river traffic, and preventing U.S. fighter bombers from landing at the newly captured Port Laoti airfield. Patton knows he'll need the firepower of those fighter bombers if his 34,000-man landing force is going to have any chance of defeating the estimated 50,000 enemy soldiers in Casablanca. Platoons of the 60th Infantry Regiment, including soft-spoken but resolute Lieutenant William Baller and his men, have spent the last two days battling their way to the immediate grounds of the Casbah. Overnight, they slept on the battlefield with only a raincoat for warmth and they've eaten cold K-rations, food items packed in tin cans and wrappers. It was like the freeze-dried ham and cheese or, or eggs. You had uh, several different types of meal where you just added water and you heated it up and it became something that was marginally passable as an edible meal. This morning, the attack on the Casbah has stalled. It's clear that rushing it with nothing but small arms is suicide. This formidable medieval fort had formidable walls, really. You couldn't break them down. We had no scaling equipment of any kind. Walls were pretty high. Even so, this morning, Area Commander Lucian Truscott orders an all-out attack. Historian Jason Morris's grandfather, John Doxey, is in the battle. Lieutenant Doxey and his company commander, Willard Barnwell, make at least one direct attempt at a breach. Barnwell and my grandfather were uh, going together, uh, essentially mounting some type of an attack against the gates of the Casbah, which is essentially just a large wooden door. Can you imagine looking at a fortress with thick walls and machine gun bunkers all around? You go right at them with everything you got, you don't hold back, and you just take it to them. Now that's guts. But the French have a machine gun trained on the gates. As they approached in their attack, uh, Barnwell got shot up uh, pretty bad. It's soon clear that further infantry attacks of this type are futile. Even though 
the emphasis is on the initiative, is on speed of action. If you don't have the right tools, if you don't have combined arms capabilities, sometimes you have to wait until you have those. By mid-morning, General Truscott himself arrives on the scene and is frustrated by the standoff. He's determined to take care of business. He calls in a heavy gun, a self-propelled M7 105mm howitzer that's recently come ashore. A self-propelled howitzer is a tracked vehicle that looks something like a tank, but it has an open top. With its powerful 105mm gun and great mobility, the M7 is perfect for heavy fire support of infantry on the move. When the howitzer Truscott calls for arrives at the Casbah, it unloads on the gates from point blank range. It just bounced right off. Finally, the general radios for assistance from Navy bombers. They swoop in and rock the Casbah with high explosives. The American Army was able to get up in time to go ahead and breach these walls before the French uh, knew what was happening, before they could recover from the concussion uh, from the bombing itself out there. The Americans rush inside, and the French surrender immediately. Later, when the 60th Infantry totals its losses from the two-day struggle for the Casbah, some 225 men are dead or missing. The capture of Port Laoti has been costly. Several dozen miles south in Fadala, Patton is glad to hear of the fall of the Casbah and the capture of the airfield. But the main prize for the overall Moroccan landing is still Casablanca, six miles south of him. Patton immediately prepares for a crushing assault on the city. But just before the attack is set to kick off, the French call it quits. Patton is pleased. He's a Francophile. He hates the thought of fighting the French. He cares deeply about suffering France as a consequence of the German occupation. Um, it pains him to have fought them for the last three days extends uh, relatively easy terms. He shows a kind of bonhomie that the French appreciate. Then Patton ends the meeting with one final request, that the French officers join him in a drink to the occasion. Later, Patton grumbles in a cable to General Dwight Eisenhower. They drank $40 worth of champagne, but it was worth it. Operation Torch has been bloody, but it's been a success. Patton has taken Casablanca, while Iran and Algiers are also safely in Allied hands. But Patton is also disappointed. He's had little opportunity to display his true talent as a commander. He writes to his wife Beatrice on November 14th. Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to distinguish myself, except not to lay down a couple of times when we got strafed. But we have made such a good start that I think we must surely go on. In the struggle for North Africa, things will only get tougher from here. But soon, Patton will be facing much larger numbers of enemy troops, both Italians and Germans. And the deadly showdown with Rommel and Kasserine Pass is looming. Patton and his British counterparts know they're in for the fight of their lives. They'll have to push their men hard if they're going to kick the Axis forces off the African continent once and for all. The first big matchup of Americans and Germans in World War II erupts in North Africa in early 1943. Untested American troops against the seasoned veterans of the Desert Fox, wily German tank commander Erwin Rommel. The 
the Americans take a pounding at first. Then George Patton arrives. And with him, a new unstoppable fighting spirit. General George S. Patton. His bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360-degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, Rommel's last stand. February 20th, 1943. Kasserine Pass in Tunisia. The German 10th Panzer Division is closing in for the slaughter. One mile north, the target? Green American troops in the floor of the pass. American forces have been in North Africa for three months, but this is their first big showdown with the warriors of the Third Reich. Allied leaders have decided that the American troops need more experience before taking on Hitler's main forces in Europe. But since landing in North Africa in November, they've only faced poorly trained French colonial units, not the Germans. Only 2,000 American troops guard the mouth of Kasserine Pass. Backed up by four Sherman tanks, 36 tank destroyers, and 18 artillery pieces. They're facing 8,000 German attackers with 100 tanks and 65 artillery pieces. Until you control those passes, uh, you're not going to be able to push the Germans and Italians either out of Tunisia or force a surrender. William Harper is a 21-year-old member of the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion. He hails from Dallas, Texas. Came in with their tanks, supported by the infantry. Infantry came right along with them. And they had us outnumbered, outgunned, and everything else. Fellow Texan Lawrence Marcus is a 25-year-old lieutenant. German tanks were coming over the hill, stopping and firing, and shells were popping all around us. Commanding the German attackers is a master of armored warfare, the Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Rommel's skill and fierceness are already legendary. In all the actions that he led in North Africa, you can see the same themes of bold, aggressive action, leadership from the front, very much personally involved with the conduct of battle. Rommel's key offensive weapon is the Mark IV Panzer. The Nazi's Mark IV tank is rolling death. Weight, 25 tons. Off-road speed, 12 miles per hour. Thickest armor, three inches. Main gun, 75 millimeters. As the tanks close in, German artillery and rocket launchers pound the American defenses. It got pretty rough. We found out real quick that they were shooting real bullets at you. <laughs> The Americans are on the brink of collapse. The outnumbered Americans could use a tough battlefield commander like George Patton. But he's not in command at Kasserine. He's back in Morocco, planning the upcoming invasion of Sicily. The American in charge is Major General Lloyd Friedendahl, He's considered an excellent trainer of soldiers, but he hasn't shown strong battlefield leadership. He really set his force up for failure. Rather than having depth in that defense, he employed his forces on a very broad front, all sort of pushed toward the front. Friedendahl is also nowhere near the front line, 
He's playing it safe. 60 miles away. Within minutes, the German panzers punch through the thin American defense. As the widely dispersed American soldiers in the valley floor give way, defenders a mile in the rear consider their options. Is it better to stand still and pop off a few rounds and get hit yourself and be out of the picture? Or is it better to retreat and come back and fight another day? And they put the pressure on them up there and came through. Everybody headed back. Rommel's troops pushed the disheartened Americans back more than 50 miles. It's a catastrophe. In terms of yardage lost, it's the greatest defeat of the American Army in World War II. There's a belief that, my God, can we fight these people? Are we good enough to fight the Germans? 19-year-old Tiford Roebuck of Tampa, Florida, witnesses the aftermath. As far as you could see were American tanks with charred bodies. They were bodies that were not charged. They were, had been pulled out and were naked. The Arabs had taken their clothes off from them. And this upset me emotionally. I, I openly cried. I'd never seen anything like this before. Within a few days, British and American reinforcements slow the German advance. Then, Rommel decides to withdraw his forces back through the pass to shore up his eastern flank. Patton's son-in-law has been captured in the fighting. And after hearing the news, the general writes his wife, Beatrice. The show was very bad, very bad indeed. On March 4th, theater commander Dwight Eisenhower fires General Friedendahl and summons Patton. Patton is an old cavalryman and tank warfare innovator. He is also as aggressive as they come, and the difference between his leadership style and Lloyd Friedendahl's is instantly apparent. How much more opposite can you get from Patton? I mean, he wants to be right up front, on the line, so he can make battle corrections immediately. He's got his thumb right on the pulse. Friedenhall is basically hiding out in a cave. Patton comes to the front lines, meets with soldiers there. He improves mail delivery. He improves their food. He does the small things that are important to a soldier. But Patton also sees that the demoralized troops need a kick in the pants. Military discipline is absent, and it's the backbone of successful armies. He immediately starts handing out fines to soldiers who aren't wearing their leggings, who don't have neckties on when they're supposed to have neckties on, who aren't wearing their helmets. Uh, $15 fines right and left. Lieutenant Lawrence Marcus is among a group of officers approached by Patton one day. General Patton said, every man old enough will shave every day. Officers will wear ties in combat. And then he came up to about a foot in front of my face and said, and anyone wearing a wool knit cap without a steel helmet will be shot. Within 10 days, Patton has Second Corps whipped into shape and on the attack, trying to squeeze Rommel into a deadly vice. The British Eighth Army, led by Bernard Montgomery, is advancing from the southeast, attempting to push the Nazis and their Italian allies northward, while Patton moves in from the west. Near Tunis, the Axis bridgehead, a second British force is already pressuring the Axis troops. Patton's 1st Armored Division will push east through McNassey, and the 1st Infantry Division will push southeast through El Guitar. 
For Patton, action flares at El Guitar Valley in Tunisia first. But he's not the one who makes the first move. March 23rd, 1943. Dozens of tanks and motorized infantry of the German 10th Panzer Division emerge from a pass onto the floor of the valley. William Harper's tank destroyer unit spots them from its position on a hill. I crawled out of M3 to see what was going on. I counted 75 German tanks out in the valley coming towards me. The Germans are trying to spoil the American advance. The Americans are trying to get the advantage, so they want to get moving right away and strike the Germans first. Unfortunately, the Germans get there, hit them early, now they got to react. Rommel is not in command. He's ill and has left Africa. And he's not a well man. He's got big skin boils. He's been in the desert a long time. He's physically exhausted. He's really run down at this point. And Hitler orders him back to the fatherland. The German commander remaining in Africa is Hans-Jürgen von Arnim, an officer who's proven himself both in the First World War and on the Russian front in this war. His Italian counterpart in Tunisia is Giovanni Messa. Messa commands Italy's Centauro Division. But the Italian fighting spirit so far has not matched the Germans. The German soldier is a professional soldier. Follows his leader's commands, and he's very disciplined. The Italians, on the other hand, the idea of empire to them is kind of hollow now. Mussolini has not led Italy to these, on the Great Crusades, he's predicted. Their motivation is nothing like the Germans. Patton's men at El Guitar are caught off guard. Lawrence Marcus commands a tank destroyer, and he soon gets word that German dive bombers are on the way to bomb the artillery. I mounted in the front seat of my command half-track, where I had a 50 caliber machine gun, cocked it, got it ready to shoot. Sure enough, in a few minutes, I saw these planes, about 13 of them, coming over in formation. Lieutenant Marcus opens fire. Soon I saw a bomb coming down and could tell from the angle that it was going to land on my right. Patton's men must prove they've learned from the mistakes at Kasserine if they're going to stand a chance at El Guitar. March 23rd, 1943, El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. General George S. Patton's 1st Infantry Division is fending off a German tank onslaught. Patton himself is still en route to the battle. The attack was a surprise, and Patton was busy coordinating an armored assault farther north. His northern and southern forces are trying to advance to the east, as British forces close in from the south and west, trying to kick the Axis forces out of North Africa. Now, at El Guitar, German Stuka dive bombers are out for blood. They had sirens and they would come down with their machine guns and drop in their bombs and turn on the sirens. And this was to scare you to death if they didn't kill you with the, with the bombs. Lieutenant Lawrence Marcus is hammering away at the Stukas with a 50 caliber machine gun on his M3 Command half-track. 75 yards away, fellow tank destroyer crewman William Harper sees Marcus in action. He was outside, and he fired the 50 caliber at the planes as they came in. Then he would switch the gun into a fellow that was inside the 
and he would fire at them as they were leaving. Just then, 400 feet overhead, a Stuka drops a bomb. I jumped out of the half track, and before I hit the ground, the bomb must have gone off. And the fragments went under the half track and hit me in three places. My left arm, over my heart, and over my kidneys in the back. Miraculously, Marcus survives, but his war is over. Most of the triceps muscle of his upper left arm is blown away. Meanwhile, German panzers keep grinding forward, but they're attacking into dangerous terrain. Ridgelines ring El Guitar Valley on three sides. A road cuts through the center and exits the valley through an opening at the east end. The American line is anchored here with infantry on the ridge and artillery and tank destroyers below. Additional infantry troops line the ridges on the north and south edges of the valley. The Americans will be able to fire on the Germans from three sides. On the other hand, there are no American tanks present to face them. Patton has ordered his tanks to McNassy, farther north. Though Patton is still en route, two capable U.S. generals are here. Terry Allen, the 1st Division commander, and his assistant, Ted Roosevelt Jr., son of the former president. Roosevelt is older and small in stature, but he rubs elbows with the troops, and they admire him. As the soldiers were getting into position early that morning, I saw General Teddy Roosevelt marching alongside the foot soldiers. He had a carbine slung over his shoulder, and he gave heart. I was proud of him. Above the valley floor, Roosevelt points out targets with the cane he uses for his arthritis while the battle rages on. The type of tank destroyer blasting away for the 601st is the 75 millimeter gun motor carriage M3. The M3 is a half track it has half-inch armor plating, and with its 75-millimeter main gun, can make fast work of most enemy vehicles. We knock out a tank, and the Germans would get out, and they would take their mounted machine gun and set it up and sit there and shoot at you. They were good soldiers. He didn't give up very easily. Today, knocking out dozens of tanks would take a fraction of the time. We have smart munitions that will actually explode over tank formations and destroy entire tank fleets, uh, destroy platoons and companies of tanks with one or two shells. You have a shell that explodes over the enemy, and these submunitions will then seek out the enemy and destroy those tanks individually. But in 1943, the 601st has no choice but to keep banging away with conventional, unguided rounds. A mile and a half in front of the 601st, part of the 18th Infantry Regiment is on a ridge line to the north. The soldiers slept on the ridge overnight. At night, the temperature would get extremely low. And so men were sleeping out in the middle of what is effectively a desert, very rocky, hilly environment sand with all of the nasty critters that live in that kind of environment. Now with little sleep, the 18th soon gets its own taste of Nazi ferocity. 20-year-old Walt Ehlers was part of the initial torch landings five months ago. Now he's with the 18th on the ridge. We were put up on this hill to protect the flank so that they wouldn't come through and get behind our artillery. Half-tracks full of German foot soldiers begin breaking away from the tank column and veer north toward the American troops on the ridge. 
we're, we're back of rocks on this hill. We, we had a pretty good defensive position, but uh, and when they were attacking up the hill, they were coming right up to us practically. And half tracks come up as far as they could, and then they drop them all. A forward observer from the artillery battalions is with Ehlers and his comrades on the ridge. And he called in the uh, ordinance for the artillery to fire on these half tracks that are coming up in mass to our hill. But the forward observer makes a tragic mistake. He got it in reverse order and they, they fired on us instead of on the Germans. Well, that was scary. That, that was scary. <laughs> that was the hardest artillery I ever felt. The Germans' artillery was bad enough, but ours was even more explosive. Radio operators scream for a ceasefire, while a round explodes so close to Ehlers, it tosses him into the air. Concussion was bad. It actually made my ears bleed. Back down in the valley, another disaster is nearing as the German tanks close in. Ted Roosevelt, on the ridge above, keeps his cool and radios for more tank destroyers. But they're six miles in the rear. There's a substantial force, maybe 40 German tanks, threatening to flank and get behind the American position. By the time the reserves arrive from six miles away, it may be too late. Luckily, A Company of the 601st Tank Destroyer Battalion opens fire from the rear of the valley as the Germans close in. They blunt the German attack. Then the tank destroyer reinforcements called for earlier by Ted Roosevelt arrive. Six, 37 tanks are destroyed very quickly in that battle because of the ability to really attack the enemy with fires from many different angles. The surviving panzers withdraw, but they soon regroup. And German foot soldiers are still attacking U.S. infantry troops in the most forward hilltop positions. A second punishing tank charge is coming any moment, one that might finally shatter the American line. March 23, 1943, 4.15 p.m., El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. Day one of the Battle of El Guitar. When the Germans launched their spoiling attack this morning, Major General George S. Patton was north, coordinating an armored push through McNassey. But now he's arrived at El Guitar. Patton is atop Hill 336 with Generals Ted Roosevelt and Terry Allen. When the Germans punch into the valley for a second time today. As Patton arrives at this scene, it's gotta be glorious for him. Here's a battle right before his eyes. His men are in action. He's been training them. He's been whipping them into shape. And now he gets to see them in action and see what they can really do. A mile and a half ahead of the German tanks, American artillery at the base of Patton's Hill lets them have it. They had these uh, 155 firing point blank at the tanks. They didn't have to shoot over or anything. <laughs> they just had to shoot straight at them. The Long Tom, the nickname for the M1 155 millimeter gun, fires a six inch round up to 14 and a half miles. A behemoth weighing 15 tons with a 23-foot barrel, it requires 14 men to serve it efficiently. The artillery rounds are fused to explode over the tops of the enemy's heads. There are vivid descriptions of the bursting artillery. You see these black bursts that look like swarms of bees and the uh, infantrymen uh, being knocked down like bowling pins. Watching the carnage from atop Hill 336, General Patton is moved. 
Patton actually laments the fact that it was a waste of really good German infantry, but it was a masterful defensive battle. Today, with the much greater ranges of modern weapons, viewing a battle in this fashion would be impossible. Patton can no longer stand up on the hill today and look through his binoculars and see the whole battlefield. Today, he has to have a council where he's looking at a series of aerial views, which are provided by satellites or by aircraft, that are giving him a much bigger view of the battle space. But in the smaller battle space at El Guitar, Patton watches the German attack stall. Finally, the German 10th Armored Division, which is severely reduced, is simply spent and unable to break through. They retreat. This threat to the entire American position has been repelled. It made the 1st Division all very proud of themselves because they whipped the Panzer Division. Patton is also proud of his men. They have beaten off a Panzer Division with infantry and artillery alone. It was well needed after the disaster at Kasserine Pass, and it was a victory for Patton. 40 miles northeast of El Guitar Valley, at the tiny village of McNassey, the 300 tanks and 20,000 soldiers of Patton's 1st Armored Division are bottled up at the mouth of a mountain pass. The 1st Armored Commander, Orlando Ward, is to take McNassey and then take the pass, but he lacks Patton's aggressiveness. He gets to McNassey, sees just a few miles to the east this ridge line which at this point is held by a handful of Italian troops and does not take the initiative to then take the pass. Instead, Ward waits to gather his forces. The delay allows a small German unit to reinforce the pass with eight Tiger tanks, 350 soldiers, and powerful 88 millimeter guns. The small force is in there like the stopper in a bottle, and they repel the American attack. Soon, a larger German force arrives to reinforce the pass, and it's a standoff. When Patton arrives here and sees this commander has stalled and lost the high ground, he's completely frustrated. He's a take the fight to the enemy kind of guy. When you have the opportunity, he wants you to act and act fast. 20-year-old Tiford Roebuck is at McNassey with the 62nd Armored Field Artillery. If you command the high ground where you can see the enemy, you can bring your artillery fire from anywhere. But if you don't have the high ground, you're at a disadvantage. On March 28th, Roebuck's battalion digs in near an olive orchard a mile south of McNassey. Their guns begin firing in support of American assaults to take the high ground. But their stationary position makes them vulnerable to return fire from the Germans. At noon, a German 88 millimeter shell lands off in the distance. But Roebuck knows the next round is likely to be closer. That's what the Germans were doing. They were adjusting. Well, they adjusted it on headquarters battery. And then when he got that is when they rained it down on. This is the first day we had ever received any fire, our first day of combat. Roebuck is with headquarters battery as a radio man. I had a half track and a radio to maintain. I have to keep in contact with core headquarters. I couldn't spend all my time in that foxhole. Every time one would hit, you would hear them cry out medics. You knew that someone was hit. And they rained some 2,000 rounds on us. And it was frightening. You just knew any minute you were, you were going to die. The 62nd will endure the shelling for 12 days. With the stalemate at McNassie wearing on, 
Allied strategy shifts. Patton fires Orlando Ward and orders 100 of 1st Armored Division's tanks south to El Guitar. If they can't get through in the north, Patton will smash through the Nazi line in the south. The pressure's on for Patton to prove he can lead a successful attack. March 30th, 1943, El Guitar Valley, Tunisia. Patton's forces have thrown back the 10th Panzer Division in a spectacular defensive victory. But his follow-up push at McNassi has hit a wall. He needs to break through somewhere so he can pressure the Germans facing the British at Meredith. But the hills overlooking the road to the fortified Meredith line are held by Germans and Italians with plenty of artillery. Second Corps runs up against German defenses, pillboxes, trenches. Germans were excellent at coordinating their fire. Now, Patton has ordered 100 tanks of the 1st Armored Division south from McNassi to try to bash their way through the Nazi line near El Guitar. He's put the tanks and some field artillery units under the command of Colonel Clarence Benson. This is an armored officer Patton knew before World War II, has a lot of faith in him. Patton knows Benson is aggressive, but the general isn't discounting the German artillery. He confides to his diary, Benson may not get through. The worst danger is the hole may close behind him. I feel confident that with God's help, it will work. Colonel Benson's force hits trouble right out of the box. The task force takes off, uh, hits a number of minefields, slows down almost to a crawl. But General Patton must prove he can lead a successful attack. And he isn't about to let a few landmines steal his momentum. Patton, in his command car, drives out in front of the task force and leads it for over two miles before Patton pulls over to the side and lets it pass. Very dangerous because the entire Patton legend could have ended that day had there been enough mines on that road. He realizes he did a pretty stupid thing, but felt that his leadership was needed in that situation. But Benson's tanks soon hit more mines. Then, a mile ahead of the tanks, Flak 37 German 88 millimeter guns open up from the hilltops. The versatile Flak 37 88 millimeter gun is one of the best Nazi weapons of the war. It fires up to 20 rounds per minute, and with a muzzle velocity of 2,600 feet per second, the dreaded 88 can penetrate six inches of armor at over a mile. Artilleryman Hobart Moline is a 20-year-old from Malacca, Minnesota. The 88 was a, like a rifle. It shot straight lines. It, it, Many a round went over our head that we could hear. 88 was real sharp crap, it, it, where the howitzer had more of a boom to it, but the 88 was like a shotgun going off in the ear. It really it, it had a crack. With the German 88s wreaking havoc, field guns of the 65th Armored Field Artillery waste no time hitting back. 20-year-old Minnesotan Wallace Ekdahl sees his commander spring into action. He put out a map of the area here so he could uh, get the coordinates where we were and uh, he guessed where the guns were. And then he fired a smoke shell to see how close he was to the gun. And then he raised up the altitude. And then he dropped down. And then he finally hit him. But another threat appears for Patton's troops. Aircraft was our big problem. The Germans dominated the air. I was standing by my half track and I heard a lot of hollering. They said, here comes the bombers. I just uh, heard the bombs come, the ground shaking. Uh, 
I went in stomach fur. Except for a coating of dirt, Wallace Ekdahl is unscathed. But others haven't been as fortunate. Two of my buddies, they were standing by their half track, and they got a pile of shrapnel. And our motorcycle person got hit real bad. They took him to the hospital, and he died there. And, uh, so that was a rough day for uh, our headquarters battery. With both the Benson Force in the south and the 1st Armored Division in the north at McNassie unable to advance, General Patton is angry and frustrated. He rants in his diary, we're stuck everywhere. You know, Patton's an old cavalry guy. Old cavalry guys just love to get their horses out in the open field, in this case, they're the tanks, and take the fight to the enemies. But he's just frustrated because he, he just can't get the horses out of the state. Then, on April 6th, Patton and his commanders sense a change. Overnight, the enemy defenses have softened. Southeast at Merith, the British have finally broken the Nazi line, and the enemy is withdrawing. They moved very slowly and destroyed most all of their equipment. There wasn't any route to it. They did it in an orderly way. They were well trained. The Germans pull back to Tunis in the north, the bridgehead to Sicily. The Allies will soon drive north in pursuit, but as they regroup their forces, some GIs get a short but welcome break. We first went to the Mediterranean because I remember we pulled off our clothes and took a bath. We had not had a bath in so long till we, we smelled awful, but I get we all smelled the same. But the struggle for North Africa is far from over and a hill outside the northern city of Bizerk will soon host another murderous brawl for Patton's fighting men. April 1943. Following the stiff fighting at El Qatar and the breakthrough of Montgomery's 8th Army at Marath, enemy troops retreat to the bridgehead in the north. The Germans and Italians dig a final defensive line, encompassing the coastal cities of Tunis and Bizerk. The Allies press in for the kill. An overwhelming Allied force rings this uh, bridgehead. The Americans in the north, the British in the south, and the squeezing begins. But for this final push, George Patton is not commanding the Americans. Ike has recalled him to Morocco to continue planning the coming invasion of Sicily. Patton must have been very conflicted by this. You know, he's a warrior. He wants to get out there and lead his men. He wants to fight the enemy. But on the other hand, what commander doesn't want to get to plan a huge invasion? Although Patton wasn't able to lead a crushing armored advance across Tunisia as he'd hoped, he did transform ragtag groups of soldiers into professional fighting units, and his boss has noticed. On April 14th, Ike writes to Patton, I hope that you personally will accept my sincere congratulations upon the outstanding example of leadership you have given us all. For the Americans remaining in Tunisia, the key objective for their final push in the north is the port of Bazert. The chief obstacle between the GIs and Bizert is Hill 609. It's a pretty imposing hill, 609 meaning the height of meters. It has a chalky fortress at the top. The topography is such so that there's a wall that you have to climb to get to the very top. The Germans have had quite some time to prepare. On top of the hill, German artillerymen have clear fields of fire and unobstructed views of much of the region. Trying to knock an entrenched enemy off the top of a hill that's well dug in, it's probably the worst fight you can get into. But what do you do? You can't give up the high ground. So you scratch, you claw, you get up that hill as any way you can and kick that other guy off that hill. 
Californian Andrew Jacobson is a 19-year-old rifleman in the 1st Division. They had these, uh, these ADAs jacked up to where they were firing right down the hill, see? And our regiment, it was quite an ordeal trying to get up that hill. Carl Peterson, also a California native, is a 20-year-old mortar man. Wherever there was a machine gun or something that was pinning the guys down, well, then we were assigned the problem of knocking that machine gun nest out. The fight for Hill 609 is incredibly vicious. They beat the hell out of us on that hill. One rifle platoon, nearly all of the platoon was killed right there on that hill, trying to take it. And we lost a lot of people in our company. I would say we probably lost a third of our company right there. The fight for 609 goes on for several days. The Germans don't want to give it up. And uh, then the suggestion is made, contrary to all common sense and doctrine, to use uh, tanks against this rather steep, fortified position. And so Sherman tanks work their way up very closely. Uh, some of them hit mines and are disabled, but it unhinges the German defense sufficiently to allow the infantry to swarm around the hill. On the evening of April 29th, after a week of fighting, Americans penetrate the Nazi defenses. After some brutal hand-to-hand, -hand, GIs finally take charge of the hill by morning. It's the beginning of the end for Axis defenses in the area. It's really one of the linchpins of the German defensive line. Bizert falls very quickly thereafter. Tunisia officially falls to the Allies on May 9th, 1943. Over the next few days, several thousand of the enemy still managed to escape to Italy. But on May 13th, the remaining Axis troops in North Africa, including top German general Hans-Jürgen von Arnhem, become prisoners of war. You have the remarkable spectacle of 250,000 Axis prisoners moving down the road toward prison cages. It is a catastrophe of the First Order for the Third Reich. For the Allies, the cost of raiding North Africa of enemy forces has been 70,000 casualties. But for the once green American forces, North Africa has been a much needed crucible, a trial by fire for battlefield leadership and tactics. You're finding out who can do it and who can't do it, who's competent, who's not competent. We're talking about leadership at all levels, from platoon leader up through corps commander, army commander. The hard-won victories have given American troops belief in themselves. In North Africa, the American soldier finds out that he can face and best the German soldier. The American equipment is not to the same caliber of the Germans, but they now have experienced what the Germans have and how to deal with it. American ingenuity, thinking on the ground, the more open give and take of the American army where the soldiers are allowed to figure out their problems and solve them is better than the German sheer discipline. Also, Patton has proven he can lead large forces successfully on the battlefield. It's confidence and vital experience U.S. forces will soon need as they follow the American Lion, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, into the brutal kill zones of Sicily. General George S. Patton's 7th Army is blasting its way across the island of Sicily. Whoever controls the airfields of Sicily will control the Mediterranean. But Patton isn't just battling against German and Italian forces. He's also competing with British rival Bernard Montgomery. Patton wants the glory of victory in Sicily to belong to his forces, not the British. Now, Patton's 7th Army slams into some of Hitler's best warriors. 
But General Patton is about to make the biggest mistake of his career. General George S. Patton. His bold attacks are legendary. See the war as he saw it and ride along with his hard-fighting troops as they battle their way through World War II. On this 360-degree battlefield, Patton's enemies could be anywhere and everywhere. There's nowhere to run when the war is all around. Patton 360, Rogue General. Sicily, July 31st, 1943. For 21 days, Patton's 7th Army has been fighting the Germans and Italians for control of the island in the first U.S. invasion of Europe. Patton heads the American forces, driving from the west. British troops are advancing from the southeast. The target capture the port city of Messina before the Axis forces can evacuate to the Italian mainland. As the men of the 1st Infantry Division battle their way up the center of the island, they grind to a sudden halt before the mountaintop city called Troina and the German defenses known as the Etna Line. It was hard country to fight in because of you know, all the hills and mountains, you know. So you'd, you'd have to take one hill after another. Troina is the highest occupied point in Sicily. It sits astride uh, one of the few decent roads going from west to east. The Americans have two highways, 117 on the coast, 120, which runs parallel to the coast, 10 or so miles inland. Those are really the only two roads that you can use to get to Messina. In command of the 1st Infantry Division is Major General Terry Allen, a personal friend of Patton's. Allen is a battle-wise, hard-drinking veteran of the First World War, who led the Big Red One to victory in North Africa. Allen was a real professional. He was also a very flamboyant, you know, character. Uh, you know, he and, he and Patton were, were very close and had a great relationship. That relationship would wear over time. Allen and Assistant Commander Teddy Roosevelt Jr., son of the famous Rough Riding President, believe that the Germans will probably fall back and not defend the town in a senseless waste of human life. Allen is dead wrong. Medium tanks and M7 self-propelled artillery can only offer supporting fire from a distance. Allen will have to hit Troina the old-fashioned way with infantry. Ah! Allen selects the men of the 39th Regimental Combat Team, a unit on loan from the 9th Division to lead the frontal attack. is a hornet's nest. The Germans, from their position on the high ground, can use their 75 millimeter guns and all their machine guns to just cut the Americans to pieces. Among the enemy guns pointed at Patton's troops is the versatile Pac-40. Designed in 1939, the Pac-40 75 millimeter is a workhorse of German artillery with a rate of fire of 14 rounds per minute and an effective range of 1,969 yards. The Pac-40 can launch a 15-pound shell that's capable of penetrating armor at 1,640 feet. If you put a Pac-40 in the right position, it could dominate a valley, it could dominate a road. So if you put that one gun with a good crew, a well-trained crew with enough ammunition in a place, you could stop movement up the narrow roads in Sicily for a very long time. But even more deadly than the well-aimed 75s are the fearsome German 88-millimeter guns. A 
veteran of North Africa and the invasion of Sicily, Carl Peterson knows firsthand just how deadly the 88 is. That was what we were scared of more than anything, because they could fire three rounds in a row. Bang, bang, bang. That was a mean weapon. The American assault is forced to cut and run. Now, Allen brings up his own big guns, 105 millimeter and 155 millimeter howitzers. Two miles away, U.S. gunfire tears the ridges and buildings of Troina to pieces. U.S. armor, in the form of the 62nd Field Artillery Battalion, join the fight. Serving in the 62nd is Florida native and North Africa veteran, Tiford Roebuck. We probably fired as many shells at trying to take Troina as, as we did at any one time in North Africa. You couldn't see the town sometime for the smoke from the bombs and artillery shells. As Allen watches the bombardment, Carl Peterson and his comrades from the 26th Infantry Regiment prepare for an all-out assault aimed at breaking the Etna Line, where Axis forces have been digging in for weeks. Flashback. July 10th, 1943. General George S. Patton leads 90,000 American troops into battle on the island of Sicily. After fighting his way off the beachhead, Patton leads an armored charge across Sicily, crushing the Italian soldiers under the command of General Alfredo Guzzoni. In less than two weeks, he marches triumphantly into the city of Palermo. Patton's army has seized its first enemy capital. They've cut the island in half. The Germans have been isolated. So what Patton's gonna do is he's gonna shoot for Messina. Field Marshal Sir Harold Alexander, commander of all Allied ground troops, orders Patton and his rival, British General Bernard Montgomery, to capture the vital city of Messina on the far northeastern point of the island. Monty's 8th Army will fight its way north along the eastern coast, while Patton makes a two-pronged assault from the west. This is the pot of gold waiting for him at the end of this battle. He feels if he can get Messina, he can prove the fighting quality of his army to the equal, if not better, than the British. Patton tells one division commander, this is a horse race in which the prestige of the U.S. Army is at stake. We must take Messina before the British. Patton's forces are split into two corps. The first, under General Lucian Truscott, will move down Highway 113 along the northern coast. The second corps, under General Omar Bradley, will head up Highway 120 through the center of the island. Target, Messina. Strategy, seize the enemy port and sea lanes, capture the Nazis before they escape to Italy, and beat the British to the finish line. Tactics, Patton's army will move in as two pincers, taking the Germans head on. But unlike Patton's charge on Palermo, Messina will be no cakewalk. American troops traveling along the coast road have a mountain at their right and the Mediterranean at their left. The Germans realize this. They're gonna blow bridges, they're gonna destroy roads. They realize the American troops are being funneled into a very narrow battlefield, and they're gonna take advantage of it as best they can. The enemy forces are under the overall command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, who's already become an expert on how to bleed the American army. He's a deadly opponent for George S. Patton. From his headquarters in Italy, smiling Albert Kesselring plans a defensive strategy to buy time for a massive withdrawal, ordering Axis forces to dig defensive lines on the high ground overlooking the vital highways. Kesselring intends to make Patton pay for every inch of ground taken in blood. The first defensive position is called the Etna Line, Running from the eastern shore of Sicily and around the base of the volcanic slopes of Mount Etna, the line stretches all the way to the Tyrrhenian Sea. 
But Patton is dead certain that his conquerors could break the Etna line and beat the British. He tells his men, you have, during 21 days of ceaseless battle and unremitting toil, killed and captured more than 87,000 soldiers. You are magnificent soldiers. You are closing for the kill. The end is certain and is very near. Messina is our next stop. Patton's drive on Messina begins in one of the Etna Line's toughest spots, the city of Troina. August 2nd, 1943, American artillery pummels the enemy high ground. Only miles away, U.S. shells rain in on the German positions. Patton told them they had to get their artillery to fire as fast and effectively as possible. As many guns as you can muster on one target at one time. The effect is devastating. But the Germans are so well entrenched that no amount of American firepower is enough to break them. The way they were dug in, it just seemed like the more we would throw our artillery at them and the more that the bombers would bomb, it just seemed like we, we couldn't get rid of them. Allen has vastly underestimated what's going to be required to take Troina. And he finally realizes he's got to put the whole 1st Division, 20,000 soldiers plus, into this attack, trying to outflank the Germans, trying to get around Troina. For the men of the 26th Infantry Regiment, the mission is to seize the high ground of Monte Basilio, two miles north of Troina, to help outflank the city. It was early in the evening. As we were going up to the hill, the Germans were right in that area. In fact, they were so close, sometimes, you know, it'd be hand-to-hand -hand going on. As Carl Peterson and his comrades get pinned down on Monte Basilio, Patton and his generals suddenly realize that the road to Messina will be uphill slaughter all the way. For five days, American soldiers from Patton's 7th Army have been hammering the town with artillery, mortars, and rifles. Patton's GIs are on a race against their British allies in the 8th Army, trying to prevent a German evacuation from Messina to Italy. What 7th Army is doing now is they're doing a sort of a two-front offensive. One part of it is traveling along the North Coast Road. The other half of his army has got the tough fight. They're stuck at the Etna Line. In his journal, Patton notes, the mountains are the worst I've ever seen. It is a miracle that our men get through them, but we must keep up the steady pressure. We must beat the 8th Army to Messina. There's a serious question about whether he was so obsessed with capturing Messina that he would risk anything to capture it. I wouldn't say Patton was reckless as much as he was obsessed. From his command post, General Terry Allen and Omar Bradley watch as American gunfire tears the city to pieces. But so far, Allen has been unable to break the German defensive along the Etna line. Troina, like most Italian towns, is a lot of stone and masonry. It's very good for fighting defensively. It's an ugly thing. It goes on and on and on. General Omar Bradley simply can't stand the hard-drinking Allen, a dislike going back to Tunisia. And as the battle for Troina drags on, Allen comes under intense pressure from both Bradley and Patton to get the job done. Right now, 
PFC Carl Peterson and the men of the 26th Regiment are in the fight of their lives on the critical high ground of Monte Basilio. We didn't get very many supplies. They'd sneak one guy or two guys out to go back and get a pack full of ammunition and stuff, bring it up. That's the way we kept us going the best we could. The GIs of the 26th, they're hell-bent on keeping the high ground, but they're running low on ammo, food, supplies, and the German machine gunners aren't making it any easier for them. For an infantryman, that's hell on earth. By the morning of August 4th, Patton's men are so low on water and ammunition that it's only a matter of time before they're driven off the hill or wiped out. On the ridges above, German machine gunners have taken up new positions overlooking the American foxholes. We were just trying to hang together. We were down on this ledge, and there was a German machine gun was over on the ridge, and they were just wiping our guys out really bad. Finally, Peterson's comrade, PFC James Reese of Chester, Pennsylvania, decides that something must be done. He immediately leads Peterson and his squad into a position overlooking the German machine gun nest and opens fire with an M2 60 millimeter mortar. The M2 mortar is a muzzle loading weapon that can accurately lob a 60 millimeter explosive at an enemy target at 1,000 yards. Its overall weight is 42 pounds, and in extreme conditions, can fire a maximum of 35 rounds per minute. It was a very effective weapon for the infantry to use in providing indirect fire and providing uh, infantry support for an attack in that kind of environment. But Reese's mortar rounds are running low, and now Patton's GIs are facing a counterattack. We didn't have much ammunition left, and we only had the one mortar down there. So Reese, he told everybody, including me, to get their butt out of there, you know. Peterson refuses to leave Reese's side, and together they continue to engage the enemy until the German fire becomes unbearable. Reese says, OK, Pete, he says, get your butt out of here. And I only had a 45 pistol, and I couldn't shoot the guys down in the brush with that, so I figured, well, I better get out, too. On his own, Reese single-handedly fires the last of his ammunition. Reese is last seen pumping an eight-round clip of hot 30 caliber lead from his M1 at the enemy before a direct hit kills him instantly. Patton's troops managed to hold their position on Monte Basilio. And thanks to PFC James Reese, the machine guns that had been killing GIs only minutes before have been wiped out. So that's what saved us, is him knocking off these extra people that were coming up. For the heroic action that takes his life at Monte Basilio, PFC James Reese will be posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. After a week of horrific combat, Patton's forces gained the upper hand at Troina. Finally, with all the bombing and the artillery, it finally softened them up, and the Germans started moving back. Terry Allen's 1st Infantry Division has opened the way for Patton's drive on Messina, but it has come at a terrible price. Troina is utterly smashed. It's been under air and artillery attack for almost a week now. There are lots of dead. German dead, Italian dead, American dead. It's one of the hardest fought battles of World War II. Andrew Jacobson, a North Africa veteran, gets a first-hand look at the aftermath. The people started coming back into the town. 
They were devastated by it, of course, but still, they weren't really ticked off at us. Even though we had destroyed the town, actually, uh, but uh, I believe that they figured the Germans caused it, you know. In the wake of the epic debacle at Troina, Terry Allen and Teddy Roosevelt Jr. are relieved of command. It was just, just like losing a, a member of the family, just like somebody, just like they'd been killed. The myth that kind of comes out of this is that Patton fired them. That's not true. It was Omar Bradley, but for some reason, it is always held that Patton is the responsible individual for the firing of Terry Allen. And the 1st Infantry Division will continuously hold Patton responsible for anything bad happening to the 1st Infantry Division. 20 miles north, Patton's advance along Highway 113 is slugging it out. The Germans have the high ground. They can put observed artillery fire down. The Germans are becoming better and better at demolitions. So if you have a culvert, it's likely to have been packed with explosives. As the casualties mount, no one feels the pressure for beating the British to Messina more than General Lucian Truscott an ex-cavalryman who fought beside Patton in the invasion of North Africa. Truscott comes up with a bold plan to break the stalemate on the coast and outfight the Nazis. And it just might turn the tide of battle and help Patton win the race to Messina. Sicily. August 7th, 1943. For more than a week, General George Patton's army and their British allies have been on a desperate race to the city of Messina and the bragging rights to victory. The image, of course, that Patton wants to portray is of an armored thrust. It's not gonna be that way. It's gonna be the 3rd Infantry Division charging along the coast. General Lucian Truscott has been hitting the enemy hard. But a full frontal assault against the coastal town of San Fratello simply isn't enough to break the Nazis under the expert command of Albert Kesselring. Truscott's gonna have to figure out some other way of getting around them, or the Germans are just gonna hold the ground till hell freezes over. Truscott comes up with a new plan, a joint Army-Navy operation He'll send his troops in on an amphibious assault behind the enemy position. If he can't break their lines, he'll just go around them. 9 p.m., under cover of darkness, Allied vessels and landing craft move into position just offshore. Onboard destroyer USS Edison is Ensign Franklin Daly of Georgia. We would have a small group of landing craft, and we would shepherd them to a point behind the enemy defenses, put them ashore, and then give them shore fire control support. We would be their artillery. The assault takes the German defenders completely by surprise. 1,000 yards away, the German soldiers still manning their positions don't know what's hit them. And Patton's troops take over a 1,000 prisoners. However, Axis commanders have already used the same cover of night to withdraw most of their troops to the city of Brolo and the high ground at Mare Cipolla. Nevertheless, the right flank of the Etna line has collapsed. They've tested a new strategy, and it works to some degree. Although they have mixed results, they get ashore effectively. Um, Patton likes this, and he wants to do it again, but this time at Brolo. Once again, Patton's GIs and armored vehicles will make an amphibious end run behind enemy lines, with the firepower of Allied warships backing them up. Truscott says, we're not ready for it. We need some more time to put it together. Patton doesn't care. He wants to go on the offensive. He needs to keep his army moving to keep it alive. Truscott, at one point, believes that Patton is doing this for the cameras. 
and believes that Patton is doing this for his own prestige. By now, most of Patton's generals and the GIs under his command are growing weary of old blood and guts. They believe that Patton's obsessive strategy has more to do with beating the British than it does with beating the Nazis. The men under Patton's command have already seen enough carnage on Sicily to fill a lifetime. They've been fighting and suffering for weeks in some of the worst terrain they've ever encountered. And tropical diseases like malaria are spreading through the ranks like wildfire. The simmering heat in Sicily is merciless. Most of Patton's men wear wool uniforms and carry a single aluminum canteen. Every day brings another batch of casualties taken out by exhaustion and fatigue. U.S. Army soldiers today are in a far better position for fighting in extreme high temperatures than they were in 1943 during the Battle for Sicily. You'll see frequently the camelback, which is a device where you have a bladder that's mounted on your back with a siphon tube that comes up, and you can periodically just take it and um, take a mouthful of water out, out of the bladder that's being carried on your back. And that helps you hydrate and stay hydrated, especially in hot weather. On an almost daily basis, Patton visits the field hospitals behind the lines. The tough as nails commander still has a soft spot for his wounded warriors. After one visit to the hospital, Patton wrote in his journal, one man had the top of his head blown off and they were just waiting for him to die. He was a horrid bloody mess and was not good to look at, or I might develop personal feelings about sending men into battle. That would be fatal for a general. He has got to be that hardened soldier, the warrior that he's always wanted to be in order to get his men to do what he wants. Now, this philosophy and Patton's personal feelings can come in conflict from time to time. For some, the nightmare in Sicily is simply too much. Back then, a man that broke down was more or less looked upon as a coward. We had over the years several men that committed suicide. They just simply can't take but so much. But for Patton, a veteran of campaigns in Mexico, World War I, and North Africa, anyone claiming to have battle fatigue is nothing more than a coward. The situation comes to a head when Patton makes one of his regular stops at a field hospital behind the lines on August 3rd. And he went there to see his boys and to uh, pay homage to those who'd been wounded, really. There is a soldier who doesn't quite fit with the others who are there wounded. In the first episode, uh, his name was Charles Cool. He was a private first class from the 1st Infantry Division. He had a fever of 102 plus. He had malaria. He had chronic diarrhea. He had various other genuine ailments. It's enough to pull him off the front lines. But when Cool tells Patton that his nerves are shot, the general suddenly explodes and slaps Cool in the face. Patton completely lost his composure, accused him of cowardice, roaring. I won't have yellow coward defaming this place of valor with these fine wounded men. And then he looks at Cool and yelled, you hear me, you son of a bitch? You're going back to the front. The key ingredient to anything Patton did was his leadership. And the key ingredient of his leadership was his ability was to inspire soldiers to do things that many of them didn't think they could do. Sometimes he used the right method. Sometimes he chose the wrong method. Only days later, Patton slaps an artilleryman in another hospital who claims to have battle fatigue. In a fit of rage, Patton reaches for his trademark Colt Peacemaker. A doctor restrains Patton before anyone gets hurt. You know, really abusing these soldiers in this way was, you know, was one of the most disappointing things about his leadership in World War II. News of Patton's violent attacks is kept under wraps but the average soldier in Patton's army is reaching his limit. By this point, the enlisted man's been driven hard. And now he's starting to think, hey, all this guy wants is the glory. He doesn't care about me. 
I mean, how the hell do you think he got the nickname Old Blood and Guts? And now, General Patton is about to send these same battle-weary soldiers into yet another bloody hornet's nest at Brolo. Sicily, August 1943. The GIs of Patton's 7th Army are slugging it out with Nazi Field Marshal Albert Kesselring's forces on a race to the city of Messina. But the clock is ticking. The Allies must get to Messina before the Germans can escape to Italy. And Patton is hell-bent on beating his rival, British General Montgomery, to the finish line. Lucian Truscott, commander of 3rd Infantry Division, performs a small amphibious landing along the northern coast of Sicily. It proves successful. It keeps the Germans guessing. It keeps them retreating. Patton sees this and wants to do another one at a town called Barolo. It's a classic pincer move. While ground forces under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Lyle Bernard sneak ashore in the pre-dawn hours, General Lucian Truscott's 3rd Division and its tank columns will hit the Germans with a full frontal attack. 1 a.m., August 11th, 1943. Bernard's forces appear off the coast of Brolo and Monte Cipolla. They're escorted by five destroyers and light cruiser USS Philadelphia. While the assault forces go ashore with Bernard, the big guns of the fleet will cover their landings and will rake the German lines with heavy fire and clear the skies of Axis planes. The landing at Brolo takes place at night. The intent is to get on top of a mountain that overlooks the road that comes along the coastline there. Things start to go wrong very quickly for this battalion. As tanks get bogged down by the terrain, the sneak attack slows down. As each minute ticks by, Patton's soldiers are losing the element of surprise. And you're just sitting there in the dark hours watching the clock tick by, waiting. I mean, the tension's got to be unbelievable for these guys. And then the sun rises, and all hell breaks loose. By 10.30 AM, Bernard's sneak attack has failed. 1,000 yards away, cruiser Philadelphia and other American ships open fire raking the enemy positions. Gunner's mates load and fire with everything they've got. But just as suddenly as she appears on the battlefield, the Philadelphia pulls out, fearing an enemy airstrike that could come out of anywhere. We usually had a lot of forewarning for, for most of those attacks. But I can understand a ship like the Philadelphia being called away from one mission quickly if she had to defend herself against an aircraft attack. The GIs are in the worst situation imaginable. They've moved into positions where they're covered by German fire, they're in the open, they can't advance. It's August in Sicily, they're scorching hot, and they have no water. Under searing sunlight, Patton's troops do all they can to hold off the Germans at Brolo with small arms and machine guns. It's like the child's game, rock, scissors, paper. If you have the rock of infantry landing, the paper that can cover that is the enemy fires and combined arms coming there. But what then you need is the scissors to cut that paper, which is naval gunfire. Finally, at 5.45 p.m., USS Philadelphia comes back. In a matter of minutes, the cruiser hammers out more than a 1,000 shells. But in the skies overhead, enemy bombers from Italy make a run on the Allied warships. While Philadelphia's main battery guns thunder away in support of the infantry, her 20 and 40 millimeter flat guns tear the skies. Philadelphia manages to fight off the air assault, but once again, the floating fortress pulls back. Bernard's men are on their last legs. They're almost out of ammunition. The air attack has also destroyed the last of their artillery pieces. The Germans are attacking with even greater ferocity. 
As night falls, small groups of American soldiers cluster together near the beaches, ready to make a last stand when the sun rises over the bloody Sicilian battlefield. Dawn, August 12, 1943. Battle-weary riflemen peer over the tops of foxholes, ready to greet another day of carnage at Brolo. But there is only silence. The enemy has simply disappeared. Really, it's the appearance coming up the road of the main force of 3rd Infantry Division that causes the Germans to fall back. Bernard's force is saved, but there are substantial casualties, a couple hundred men. But despite the costs, Patton's strategy of outflanking the enemy has worked. For the Nazis, Sicily is a lost cause. From his headquarters in Rome, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring plans the final evacuation of his entire army to mainland Italy. Thousands of enemy troops begin a fighting retreat, falling back and doing all they can to buy time to make their escape. August 14, 1943. Patton's 7th Army is now almost within sight of their target, the port city of Messina. As Peter Havali and the tankers of the 753rd Battalion move within miles of Messina, they get a close-up look at German firepower. So we're moving in column. We reached the end of the road. It was an empty lot, maybe 50 feet wide, 100 feet deep. And once the first tank passed this empty lot, the Germans began to shell us. Caught in the open, the American tank column is in danger of being cut to pieces on the deadly road to Messina. August 14th, 1943. Patton's 7th Army is only miles from the finish line. The port city of Messina and victory in Sicily. His rival, British General Bernard Montgomery, is also moving in. The two Allied armies are nearly neck and neck. But right now, Peter Havali and his comrades in the 753rd Tank Battalion are in danger of being destroyed by artillery as they move up a road in support of American infantry. Enemy guns still cover the approaches to Messina, buying time for the German retreat. Hafali's commander immediately orders the tankers to pull back and take cover behind a row of buildings and wait it out. So we got in there, shooting the ball, going to find out what the hell we're going to do next. Then pretty soon a jeep pulls up, and the guy comes out. Guess who? General Patton. So he looked at the lieutenant. He said, what are you doing here? He said, well, he said, we're supposed to go and attack that area there. They said, get your freaking ass out of here and go ahead and do it. The tanks immediately take off, guns blazing. While Havali drives the tank, he directs the fire of his gunner. The stewards spray lead at anything that moves. I said, yeah, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And he pointed the gun right away. He fired, he hit that sucker right in the middle of boom, and just blew it up. And then we kept on going. A lot of vehicles burning, burning flesh. It's, it's, it smells like crazy. A lot of dead Germans. From then on, the road was open, clear to Messina, with no problems. Midnight, August 17th, 1943. Enemy ships run back and forth between Sicily and Italy, evacuating the cream of Albert Kesselring's army just ahead of the arrival of American and British troops. Smiling Albert Kesselring's strategy of delay and retreat has paid off. Hours later, battle-weary GIs finally reach the outskirts of Messina with orders to keep any British units from entering until Old Blood and Guts himself can march triumphantly into the city. 
despite a fever of 103 degrees, Patton lays claim to Messina for the U.S. Army at 10 a.m. But victory is bittersweet. Yeah, it's not an unvarnished triumph. Um, the island is taken. For Patton, it's glorious, and yet he's got himself in the worst problem of his life. Days earlier, Patton personally slapped two soldiers suffering from battle fatigue. At first, the story was kept under wraps. But when the news of the incidents reaches the press, the public outcry is enormous. Eisenhower wrote a scorching letter to uh, Patton saying, nothing has given me more pain in my military career than this. I have to question your fitness for high command. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, orders Patton to apologize to the two soldiers he slapped. But Patton takes it a step further, apologizing to every division under his command. That wasn't good enough for me. That didn't satisfy me. I didn't like him before he slapped him, but that just did it with me. He had no right to put his hands on those boys. He's won the biggest victory the U.S. Army has seen so far in the European theater. His Seventh Army has not lost a battle. Yet, because of the slapping of two soldiers, Patton is now going to go into exile. He's going to pay for what he did. Though the American and British armies have won a valuable base of operations in Europe, victory in Sicily has come at a terrible price. In 38 days of battle, Patton's 7th Army has suffered the loss of 2,237 killed in action and another 6,500 wounded. Overall, the Allies have lost 24,000 men to combat, wounds, and disease. Sicily has been characterized as a bitter victory because while it achieved the objective of defeating the German forces on the island of Sicily, the German forces were in large measure able to escape intact. And these are the same forces, these very well-trained, well-equipped divisions that U.S. forces would have to face in Italy. While Patton waits in exile, most of his combat soldiers head into battle under other generals. Peter Havale and Tiford Roebuck will go on to Italy, where they'll once again face smiling Albert Kesselring. Carl Peterson, Andrew Jacobson, and the men of the 1st Infantry Division go to England, where, along with thousands of other American soldiers, they prepare for the Normandy invasion. For now, all that Patton can do is hope for vindication and pray for another chance to close with the enemy. That November, Patton writes in his journal, my command has so far disposed of 177,000 Germans, Italians, and French, killed, wounded, and prisoner. It would be a national calamity to lose an army commander with such a record. He's afraid that if he loses this command, he'll never be in the war again. He'll never get another shot at the enemy.